Cancer then versus now. How has cancer treatment changed over the last 50 or 100 years? Is the cure for cancer a reality or just a myth? The views expressed in this podcast are my own thoughts and opinions. They do not reflect the values of my employers. Welcome to the Crossover Connections with Jack Wayne podcast. My name is Jack. I'm a scientist and college professor at an Australian university. And this is a podcast about science, technology, productivity, and careers, and how everything is more connected than we really think. Today's episode is about the big C, cancer. Cancer then versus now through multiple lenses, multiple perspectives, detection, treatment, prevention, as well as our understanding of it from a fundamental molecular level. Let's get the elephant out of the room first. There will not be a cure for cancer as the press likes to report it. Every new discovery in cancer therapy is deemed as a cure. And that is actually very counterproductive to the conversation around cancer biology and the conversation around cancer research that needs to happen to take the next step forward. One in three people have some form of cancer and will develop some form of cancer at some point in their lives there is no quote-unquote cure but we have many different therapies for many different types of cancers and we've come a long way the first myth to dispel there is not one uniform type of cancer that affects everyone people who are trying to treat different types of cancers are combating against at least 40 different types of cancers as you can see here from the national institutes of health national cancer institute there is a big list of the different cancers ordered alphabetically that's a clue that there's so many you have to have some kind of dewey decimal system of organization cancer is ultimately uncontrolled division of cells where it keeps growing and growing to the point where it forms tumors that then spreads to other parts of your body and we can't stop the cell growth and it eventually takes over the body and kills us where in the body they're replicating how quickly the cells are growing would dictate how quickly the disease progresses if you work in cancer research or you're an oncologist you have to first of all say I work on this type of cancer because the fields are really different. Someone working on skin cancer will have a very different outlook as someone who's working on brain cancer, which brings me back to that same point. There won't be a single unified cure for cancer, but that's not to say we haven't made tremendous progress. And I think that term has really undersold the real value of many of the researchers working in cancer biology today. Let's look at how cancer is diagnosed. It was diagnosed as a disease that had no treatment anyway, so detection didn't seem that much of a concern or a priority. But detection is absolutely a priority in this day and age. Bowel cancer is something that is typically associated with older demographics of people, but this article is saying that even young people can be at risk of bowel cancer, and it really is a PSA, a public service announcement. In Australia, we have home testing kit that you could basically submit as part of the National Bowel Cancer Program, and we post these free home testing kits to Australians between 50 and 74 years of age every two years. This is a real measure of progress in this type of cancer. We're very good at diagnosing it if you know to look for it. Another type of cancer that has very, very good sense of diagnostics, skin cancer, specifically a very aggressive type of skin cancer referred to as melanoma. In Australia, we're blessed with amazing sunshine most of the year. Been told from the time we grow up as little kids here, we need to always make sure you've got sunscreen, hat and shirt. You won't cover up as much of your skin to the sun as possible. We have trained hairdressers, barbers, and beauticians to detect melanomas. Like you never see the back of your head or certainly rifle through your scalp at the top of your head. These are parts of us that we never really see routinely. So it would make a lot of sense for barbers, hairdressers, and beauticians who see these weird spots around our head. They're actually a really good focal point as part of the diagnostic effort for skin cancer and for melanoma because melanoma can be anywhere on your body and it can come down to a little red blemish or a dry flaky bit of skin. Early detection is absolutely essential when it comes to skin cancer, a combination of cutting the the cancerous tumor out, multiple drugs, and maybe some localized chemotherapy might be useful. We've gotten so sophisticated at detecting it, we can train barbers, hairdressers, and beauticians to recognize these melanomas. There is lung cancer screening clinics that have become more routine in England, a nationwide screening program, especially deciding to focus on smokers and former smokers within a certain age bracket, aged 55 to 74, invited to get their lungs scanned. This is using a low dose computerized tomography or a CT scan to look at the lungs, to look for certain lesions or abnormal growths. This clinic is mobile, it's on wheels. It will travel around to different locations in the UK and really invite people 
who are in these risk categories to go in and get their lungs scanned. If there's any early signs of lung cancer appearing, that will direct them to treatment that much earlier. Doesn't just stop there because we can also leverage AI to help diagnose different types of cancers. And the next article talks about the use of AI in detecting breast cancers, doing an X-ray and taking an image and then looking at that image of breast tissue to see if there's potential cancer or cancerous lesions or tumors that can be found anywhere in those scans. And it's the picture that comes out that then needs to be interpreted by an oncologist. You need specialist training to be able to read these mammograms and not to overinterpret or not to underinterpret. So it takes a lot of expertise and there is human judgment involved. The mammograms, when submitted as part of an AI training toolkit, the AI algorithms are much more consistent in being able to pinpoint potential cancers. It's a training data set. You already know the answers going in. You know, this image came from a patient who did then go on to develop breast cancer. Let's see what the AI says. So you go with knowing the answer. They followed 80,000 women who attended a screening program in one area of Sweden and to see if AI could direct a radiologist's attention to suspicious but very subtle abnormal areas on a mammogram. 36,000 fewer screenings read by the radiologist and the AI supporter group. And there was a 44% reduction in the radiologist screening workload, streamlining the workflow for interpreting mammograms and referring women on to further diagnostics in breast cancer. This is all much more advanced than most people realize. There is no cure, but we've made such incredible advances in the last 20, 30 years to dismiss that there's no cure is really doing a disservice to all of the people who work in healthcare and medicine and diagnostics in the science research part of the pipeline. There is a lot of progress that's been made. And depending on the kind of cancer you have, the prognosis can be very good, especially if you get detected early on. The downside of this is that there is this concept that's referred to as overdiagnosis. And in fact, in Australia, 29,000 cancers every year are overdiagnosed. It doesn't mean that it was incorrectly diagnosed. Indeed, a form of cancer that was detected. One in four cancers detected in men in 2012 were an example of overdiagnosis. The cancer is indeed an overgrowth of cells, but they are harmless that either never grows or grows very slowly. They're low or ultra low risk cancers that wouldn't have spread or caused any problems, even if left untreated. Picking up these extra growths on scans and being more conservative and subjecting patients to treatments, some combination of radiation therapy or chemotherapy and surgery, which are not risk-free procedures. We are also causing an incredible amount of health anxiety and family stress, knowing that someone in your family has cancer, maybe then it's genetic and everyone else in the family needs to go get screened. It causes a tremendous amount of stress. The cancers that were overdiagnosed include prostate cancers, melanomas, kidney cancers and thyroid cancers, as well as breast cancers and melanoma, thyroid cancers and kidney cancers in women. So again, this is a byproduct of great early detection of cancers. I think we're still seeing the unintended consequence of this unfold for a few years to come. We need even more sensitive diagnoses to be able to differentiate from cancers that are truly benign, harmless if left untreated, versus cancers that will deteriorate very quickly and grow and cause very fatal circumstances for the patient if left untreated for even a month or a week. The key to overcoming the problem of overdiagnosis is not less diagnosis, it's improving the sensitivity and accuracy of our diagnostic methods, which comes back Back to research and development. The saying goes, prevention is better than cure. So how has our understanding of the cancer risks improved then versus now? Let's look historically what people thought to be the causes of cancer. And when I read this, it seemed like a very bizarre concept to me because it's so steeped in superstition. The early theories about cancer causes, according to the American Cancer Society's historical section on the website, which is a very interesting read, where ancient Egyptians blamed cancer on the gods. There is also the humoral theory where Hippocrates believed the body had blood, phlegm, yellow bile, and black bile, and you need to have a balance of all of those four humors or four types of body fluids really wasn't particularly scientific at all. There then was the lymph theory that replaced the humoral theory of cancer, which talks about the idea that you need to have lymph all through your body in the right amount of density acidity and alkalinity and lymph is the cause of all tumors so just get rid of your lymph and you won't get cancers clearly that's not true the lymphatic system is incredibly important for our immunity and our proper function in the body so this theory was also thrown out a lot of people think trauma 
gives you cancer, if you go through a lot of bad things in your life, then you're more prone to cancer. And what we now understand to be the main risk factors for cancer revolve around two main camps. One is being exposed to an external stimulant that is a carcinogen that increases the risks of cancers happening. And what's happening at the molecular level is that DNA is being changed to promote cell growth. And this change in the DNA can be caused by environmental agents. For example, certain viruses, if they infect you, they could increase the likelihood that your cells would start dividing uncontrollably and that would lead to cancer. There's also a number of chemicals that can cause these same kind of problems in your DNA. The UV radiation from the sun can lead to mutations that force your cells to grow quicker over time. The article gives you a number of viruses that can infect and give you cancer. Hepatitis B or C can lead to cancer of the liver, herpes virus, the Epstein-Barr virus, non-Hodgkin lymphomas and nasal pharyngeal cancer, and HIV can also cause cancer and HPV, human papilloma virus can cause cancer. The most well accepted orthodoxy around the causes and risks for cancer comes down to genes namely oncogenes or tumor suppressor genes. Oncogenes are genes that normally cause cells to divide. For some reason, they've been sent into overdrive and they will promote cell growth very, very quickly in an uncontrolled way. Cell growth is actually very much a good thing. You actually want your cells to divide, but that rate of division needs to be very carefully controlled. And normally it's controlled through an oncogene that has very, very strong off switch rather than a very strong on switch. So when the oncogene is turned on, normally it should turn itself off very quickly. But in the case of cancer cells, oncogenes have been mutated to the point where their off switch is very weak and their on switch is very strong so that they're always promoting cell growth very, very consistently. So there's one type of gene that could be mutated either through some kind of viral infection or through some kind of chemical you've been exposed to, or maybe you just inherited a copy of an oncogene from your parents. The other class of gene is tumor suppressor genes. And tumor suppressor genes are there designed to turn cell division off and suppress the growth of tumors and suppress cells growing. So at all times, our body is in this balance where oncogenes are promoting cell growth while tumor suppressor genes are slowing cell growth down to make sure that we don't have any abnormal growth of cells in our body. If you have cancer, three or four of these oncogenes and tumor suppressor genes in your body are broken to the point where they're not slowing down cell division and cells are dividing very, very quickly. Throughout the course of your life, you expose yourself to more risk factors. You accumulate mutations in either these oncogenes or tumor suppressor genes. Symptoms of cancer manifest. There are, of course, people who are born with way more mutations in these genes. And that's where the really sad cases of childhood cancers or babies who are born with cancers, they already are born with a few of these mutations in their system. They don't need any exposure to chemicals or infectious agents. They have these mutations built in, which is another reason why we don't want to expose ourselves to risk factors. None of us really know how many mutations we have already in our system when we're born. So by exposing ourselves to risk factors, we're just increasing the likelihood that the existing mutations would have these extra mutations added on top. We will cross some threshold where the cell division stops being so carefully controlled in our body, and then we get cancer. We know way more about risk factors for cancer now than we did then back in the day. And this is a link from Cancer Australia, which goes through to talk about the risk factors and how we reduce personal risk for cancer. Smoking is a big one. Smoking causes 20% of cancer deaths in Australia. So tobacco smoking is something that you should really be very clear on that it is a huge risk factor. If you're born without any mutations and any of the oncogenes or tumor suppressor genes in your body, you could probably smoke for a long time and not have cancer anywhere near as early as someone who already is born with two or three of these mutations. Smoking is obviously one of the biggest risk factors. Another one is relating to just our general well-being, our general health, physical health, nutrition. There's also alcohol, UV radiation, and occupational exposure to chemicals. And the next article is relating to Johnson & Johnson, which had just settled for 27.6 million to a California man who says he got cancer from baby powder, talc-based products, the constant exposure to the baby powder that had these talc compounds that was associated with mesothelioma 
in the tissues around his heart as a result of his exposure to talc baby powder since childhood. So every now and then you'll see these headlines in the news where there's a new chemical that's been connected to the cause of cancer and usually there's a settlement involved and hopefully that improves the amount of chemicals or streamlines the amount of chemicals that are available and used very routinely. All of this is progress. All of this is advancement. Once we know something causes cancer, we usually remove it from circulation. We don't double down on its negative impact. Again, this shows you how far we've come since the days where people were smoking cigarettes and using talc-based baby powders, inhaling asbestos, working in these asbestos sites, which is another risk factor. All of this is good sign of progress. How has treatment of cancer improved then versus now. Of course, back in the day, cancer treatment was not a thing. People thought there is no cure, there's no treatment. Let's just find out if it was cancer after the person died. Really shocked me when I went back and read it. I didn't really know. Nitrogen mustard gas crosses all of these human ethical boundaries even during wartime. People think, well, war is war, but we're not savages. Let's not resort to mustard gas and nitrogen mustard gas. But believe it or not, it was used for treating cancers because at the heart of it, these nitrogen mustard gases, they are designed to be cytotoxic. They kill cells by preventing DNA replication. The cells that are growing the quickest in cancer patients will be cancer cells. It doesn't mean the nitrogen mustard gas won't kill all of the other cells, but they will kill the cells that are more quickly growing and growing the quickest, the quickest. So they will have an indirect, if not outsized impact on the cancer tumor itself and it might shrink that tumor so people were very excited there have been a lot of efforts in trying to streamline the structures of these nitrogen mustard compounds to see if they can take away the bits that are really bad for you and don't really help the cancer but have all of this toxicity it is still a little too dangerous a little too many side effects when not administering nitrogen mustard gas as part of a very routine visit to your oncologist in this day and age we've come a long way on that issue of specificity the next category of drugs had a similar problem aminopterin and it is a derivative of folic acid and it is an anti-neoplastic drug used in chemotherapy this drug works by binding to the folate binding site of the enzyme dihydrofolate reductase. Dihydrofolate reductase makes a lot of nucleic acids for our body. It makes the components, the building blocks of DNA. It also makes the building blocks of energy that cells use. So if you're blocking this enzyme, then you will not be able to make the raw components of DNA. Therefore, you will slow down DNA replication and you will slow down cell growth and ultimately lead to cell death. This drug, aminopterin, would be able to slow down cell growth because it literally stops the DNA from having enough components to be used in cell division. Sounds great, but again, this has an issue of specificity. The cells in our body that will grow the quickest, yes, would be cancer cells, but also it would be skin cells and epithelial cells. Epithelial cells are in the lining of our mouth, in our respiratory tract, in our stomach lining, in our intestines. So it's no wonder that people who go on chemotherapy, also radiotherapy, their hair falls out, they're always having nausea, they're vomiting a lot, they're going to the toilet a lot, they just feel terrible all the time. It's because these drugs are targeting cells that are quickly growing, which include cancer cells, yes, but also include all of the other cells in your body that are doing their normal functionality. Aminopterin, yes, it's better than mustard gas, but still it's processes that is targeting is not that specific to cancer cells alone and you have a lot of indirect side effects from taking these drugs even if they're not cancer cells other cells are growing and they will be attacked by these drugs that's much more primitive in terms of how we think about cancer therapies how has cancer therapies evolved vaccines and the most famous cancer vaccine is the one against hpv human papillomavirus which is the most common sexually transmitted infection in the United States for sure, but I think in the world in large, it is a cancer caused by a virus and is spread from person to person via sexual transmission. And once you're exposed to the virus, your risk of cervical, vaginal, vulva cancers and all of these cancers relating to those areas in both men and women, they go up dramatically. So really the vaccine limits the effect that exposure to the virus will have on the person and therefore cuts down on the incidence of these cancers. The vaccine against HPV, 
is Gardasil. Once you identify the original cause, then treatment becomes a more streamlined process. And this provides a model for us to examine all the other cancers. But the problem with all the other cancers, let's say skin cancer, is that exposure and the cause is multifactorial. You really can't eliminate that risk factor completely. Vaccines against other kinds of cancers will have to have a slightly different strategy. Again, illuminating the idea that we actually have a really good cure for HPV and cervical cancer. It's this vaccine. It's great. It works incredibly effectively. It's just because cancer is over 40 different diseases, this one treatment, one type of cure won't work against all of these other cancers out there. The other type of treatment that is increasingly gaining momentum in anti-cancer therapies, immunotherapy, which is similar to vaccines. The one that is most recently on everyone's radar is something that's called CAR T cell therapy. CAR T cell therapy. And the CAR and CAR T therapy stands for chimeric antigen receptor CAR T cell therapy. It changes T cells, which are part of all of our immune systems anyway. It retrains T cells to recognize cancer cell surface antigens so that it only targets and kills cancer cells. Well, T cells are designed to do lots of different things, but the ability to recognize specific parts of germs that our body has previously been exposed to is something that T cells really do very effectively anyway. CAR T therapy modifies these T cells and retrains them to only recognize and kill cancer cells, that resolves the specificity problem that drugs like aminopterin or nitrogen mustard gas, they can't quite overcome that specificity problem. They're just killing all cells and the likelihood that they were going to kill cancer cells is higher than killing the other cells because the cancer cells grow the quickest. But these kinds of immunotherapies, they really work much more effectively because they're training immune cells to recognize one specific type of cancer cell structure. And this, I believe, will be the future and limit the other side effects you may experience through cancer therapies. And on that note of incremental progress, that brings us to our recurring podcast segment, Whose Job Is It Anyway? Looking at how the news headlines and the themes in science, tech, and productivity influence your ability to find work that is meaningful and future focused. We're going to do that same exercise we've done in previous episodes. We're going to log on to a job website and search for jobs that are related to cancer. The job website in Australia that I'm going to use is a job website called Seek. How can we play a role in that whole ecosystem of diagnosis, prevention, treatment to support if you find work in this area is actually very meaningful and very valuable to yourself as well as to the broader healthcare sector. And if we look for cancer jobs using the keyword cancer in Australia, there are over a thousand jobs that emerge when you search for it, 1170 jobs. Something I hear a lot from students who are new to university and new to college, I don't want to be stuck in a lab for the rest of my life. And if you look down a list of jobs relating to cancer, a very small fraction of them are actually based in a research laboratory. There's a lot of employment around cancer that's around supporting this whole system. I'm not gonna go through all 1170 jobs, but there is a critical care stream hospital medical officer. There is a nurse unit manager. So these are people who work in the hospitals and clinics. You've got empathy and sympathy and great communication skills. You can really find consistent work in these clinics dealing with these patients who are at crossroads in their lives. You can make a real impact. And you're going in there and talking to different stakeholders, the funding agencies, the doctors, the lab researchers, as well as coordinating with ethics and institutional review boards. This is just as important a job as the people doing the actual research. There are also people who work for non-for-profit organizations, for example, Cancer Australia, where your job is to be out in the community, doing outreach, doing education, doing public service announcements, and really connecting with the cancer patients and cancer families to both raise funds that support cancer research and or raise awareness for things like early detection of certain types of cancer. So if you are really interested and very passionate and empathetic about the plight of cancer patients, but you don't necessarily see yourself as the person in the lab driving the innovation, that doesn't mean you can't contribute. You can find meaningful work that is of high value to society. And ultimately, that is what will make you sustain that work and sustain that employment into the future. You can find our podcast on all the podcast platforms, wherever you listen to all your audio feeds, as well as on the YouTube channel, Biolab Collective with Jack Wang. That's it for this episode. I'm Jack. Hope to connect with you again next time around.